My name is Tisa, and I serve with the worship team. And tonight's teaching text comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 1 through 25. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing in the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children, after they may, them, may fear the Lord your God, as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. For the Lord your God, who is among you, is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not put the Lord your God to the test as you did at Massa. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so that it may go well with you, and you may go in and take over the good land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors, thrusting out all your enemies before you, as the Lord said. In the future, when your sons ask you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws that our Lord God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God, so that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good evening, everybody. It's great to see you tonight. Uh, this is going to be a good night studying this passage together. Uh, before we take a look at this, though, I wanted to give you uh, an update on our Together campaign. Uh, the Together campaign, as you'll remember, uh, was uh, an initiative, an end-of-year initiative for, for three specific things in our church. The first one was a ministry center. How many of you have, have popped over there, been to an event there, gifts course, welcome to church or whatever? Well, the rest of you are invited. You're all invited to come over there. Uh, the second thing was to basically build an ecosystem of thriving for families, to really invest in our next generation ministries, kids ministries, student ministries, to have a conscious formation pathway from birth to college. 
for the kids growing up in our church. And the third thing was um, a seed fund for new missions uh, initiatives that we've got coming out of our church. And our vision was to get $400,000. And I'd like to announce the title tonight. Here's, a, here's what it is. $479,693.55. So that is, that is just an amazing an amazing wave of generosity. You will remember this is above regular giving to the life of our church. So I just wanted to pause for a minute and just to say thank you for believing in what God is doing here. Thank you for giving and just b- believing for the future of our church. Thank you for sowing and investing in these things. And uh, it's my genuine prayer that God will bless you and prosper the work of your hands for sowing into his kingdom. Not in, not in some sort of prosperity gospel, but in a real way that God will reward your sacrifice. And uh, so thank you so much. And we're very, very excited. You'll see over the course of the year um, some of the initiatives that roll out. And when you see them, you'll be able to say, I got a stake in that. That's, that's, uh, I'm invested in that. So thank you so much. Uh, we are in a series for the next month on basically sort of a blueprint for revival. And I did two revival tours, one last year, and uh, I've been on one this year. And basically just trying to understand what, it, what are some of these principles that, that seem to happen? What are the human factors that happen in these moves of God? And one of the things I, I came away with was just this awareness that there's four kinds of altars that there needs to be fire on. The first one is the altar of the heart that I preached on last week. The second one's the altar of the home, which we're going to address tonight. Next week, we're going to talk about the altar of the church and then the week after that regional prayer. But tonight, we are talking about how to build an altar in a home. Here's a, here's a picture of um, my home. Go ahead, take a look at this. It's a strong, strong little family portrait, isn't it? It's kind of tidy in the front. There's a little party in the back there. You notice that? I've chosen this beautiful moment in my family's history because this is when I was the most popular in my teenage years. So this is me at peak popularity. And that really does say a lot about... The early 90s, doesn't it? <laughs> I wonder if we were to pull up uh, a photo of your family. And just to ask the question, what comes up in your heart when you think about your home? For some of us, the family is a place of tremendous pain. We look back in our lives. Some of you are here tonight and you've got wounds in your heart. Things that were carelessly spoken over you. Maybe you've got one or both of your parents missing or absent from major scenes and important things in your life. You feel like they just didn't care for you. They didn't get it. And when you think of the family, it's a place of deep pain. Others of you come from great families and the family is a thing of possibility. You can't wait perhaps to have your own family one day or you just love gathering with your family at Christmas in the holidays and you just get together and you've got traditions and you've got your own family culture and it's a source of tremendous joy in your life. I wonder what happens in our hearts when we think about the family. Families shape us in disproportionate ways. Freud picked up on this family dynamics, popularized it in psychology for over a century and we're still today coming to terms with the impact that our homes have on us later in life. Now, you may be here tonight and you're like, look, I'm not married. How am I going to build an altar in my home? I don't even have children. But I I want us to see the importance that the home and and a family altar can have. Do you know, if if your parents lie to you when you're younger, even little white lies, it can create suspicion, a hermeneutic of suspicion of relationships for the rest of your life. If your mum is stressed when you were young, it is shown that you will not be as good at math and some of the other sciences, that it impacts how we're raised. If your parents share their feelings and they're vulnerable with you, it lowers the rate of divorce later in life for people. It has a huge impact on us. And so if we are going to see a movement of God that really touches this city, we've got to figure out the family, the home, how to build altars where we'd raise up and give away what we have to the next generation. Now, again, if you're here and you're single or you don't have children, perhaps think about it like this. How do I leave a spiritual legacy to disciples and spiritual children? How do I leave a spiritual legacy to the children of this church, the youth of this church? What can you do to build an altar that they can come and worship at because of your faithfulness? Well, we get a biblical idea of why this is important and how to go about doing this in this particular passage. Deuteronomy 6 is one of those hinge passages in the entire Bible, not just because it contains the Shema, this confession about the nature of 
who God is and his declaration, his creed for his people. But because it's one of those hinged moments where when you read the rest of the Bible, if they get this right, there's so much promise in it. But if I get this wrong, there's going to be spiritual disaster. And so you have this poignant moment in the history of of God's people where it's basically a DTR. God is doing a covenantal reaffirmation with his people. Here's who I am as your God. And here's what I want to do for you. And here's what I will provide for you. And here's how I want to bless you if you just obey me and you love me. And so he basically says what he will do and then what their responsibilities are in this relationship. And one of the things I want you to see is that God's heart is that spiritual life and blessing will flow down generational lines. They're getting ready. They're coming out of a a history of slavery in Egypt, and they're going to go into a land that is spiritually seductive, that's filled with idolatry. And he just says, look, I want you to be faithful to me, and I want you to pass on blessings and not curses for generations to come. So be faithful. Be faithful. And so tonight, I think there's a few things that we can learn about building altars in homes and passing on godly, generous, life-giving spiritual legacy to those who come behind us. And this is a complex passage. There's many ways this could have been broken up tonight. But I've tried to do it simply because I think that, that not just because it's memorable, but we see these principles in the text. And here's basically what they are. You have to break off some things from your past. And you've got to build some things for the future. And if we do this, if we break off ungodly things and we build godly things, In the context of relationships and spiritual legacy, we will build altars that others can worship at that attract the presence of God in our lives. So let's take a look at these. The first things we need to break off. First thing we need to break off, spiritual complacency. Now this is a warning. God's about to bless them. God's about to prosper them. But he knows when they get all of the goodness of his hand, if they're not careful, they'll forget the love in their hearts. Look at what it says in verse 12. When the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you, a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant, then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And this is what he wants them to know. Physical prosperity can numb us into spiritual apathy. It sort of just happens. You know, you know when you first move to New York and you're like, God, I just have one prayer. I'm desperate, Lord. I don't make 40 times the income to rent my own apartment. Lord God, I'm asking for three things. <laughs> no bed bug history in the building, Father, in the name of Jesus. I'm asking for my own room, Lord God, with a window. And Father, I'm asking in Jesus' name for non-weird roommates. That's all I ask, Lord God. There can be a level of desperation, dependence on God. And when you go for those job interviews or you start that internship or you take the new position, you're praying and you're dependent because you realize only God can do that. But then after a little while, you make your way and you shift from desperation to brunch. And then you start building your little ecosystem of joy and life in the city. And before you know it, something can creep up in your heart that kind of says, it was my hard work that opened this door. It was my gifts, my skill. My relationships, and if we're not careful, that desperation turns into entitlement. And the children of Israel, he's warning them against falling into this trap. We have to keep that humility, that hunger, that gratitude, that desperation alive from generation to generation. We cannot let blessings rob us of hunger. This is true in the natural realm as well. 70% of wealthy families lose their wealth by the second generation and a stunning 90% by the third generation. Why is this? Because normally there's a hardworking, disciplined, visionary, strategic person that gets a vision and goes after it. And, but in his heart, he's got, he's got, he's got you know, financial skills and he's got leadership skills and he's got discipline, he's got gratitude and appreciation. But then when his kids inherit that, they don't want to hear stories about when I was your age and dad's sacrifice and blah, blah, blah. They just want to enjoy the lifestyle that's available to them. And often because they don't appreciate, they don't have the skill to further it and pass it on. The behaviors that produce the wealth are not imparted and so the wealth declines. And so the third generation are often left without nothing. And that principle happens with the children of Israel. You see this in the book of Judges. 
the ones who experienced the wonder and the miracles of God. It says, another generation that arose that neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. They failed to tell the story and they cycled out of blessing in the curses. You've got to break off spiritual complacency. The Moravians, which is uh, one of my favorite communities, uh, Nicholas, I count uh, Nicholas Zinzendorf, amazing gentleman, heart for God. And he pastored a little community in, in a place called Hernhut, where our, our College of Prayer is actually going in a couple of months to see this prayer meeting. And he, he led a prayer meeting there, started a prayer meeting that lasted 24 hours a day for 100 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they would gather in the mornings, they would walk through the streets singing hymns to wake up the community, and they would pray together. And at night they would close the day, the morning watch. The night watch had these beautiful movements of faithfulness to God. And people began to complain a little bit and they would say, well, like, come on, this is too much. We love God. We're on fire. This is revival. So let's just calm it down a little bit. Do we really need to be so intense? And he's, he has this beautiful response where he, he says, we're not doing this because we're lukewarm. We're doing this to fend off lukewarmness. We've got to push back on the atrophy, spiritual atrophy, the plans of the enemy to crowd out, to rob us of hunger and desperation for God. And I see this so often is that we can, we can get complacent, particularly as parents. Well, the kids have a youth group now, so I can calm down. Youth pastors got it from here. Well, you know what? They're going to a pretty good school. It's not that secular, so I'm not that worried about their education anymore. And we have to cultivate hunger for God. We've got to break off spiritual complacency. We've got to have zeal and we've got to pass passion on to the next generation. In my own parenting, I, I never just wanted to see moralism in the life of my kids. I was always trying to get underneath their hearts. Do I sense spiritual affection in their hearts for God? Free will, voluntary spiritual affection. I look for small little things, things that would bless my heart. Are they increasing in the fruit of the Spirit? Is the life of God manifest in them or is it just mere external religion? Have I even shared the gospel with my children? It's so often, you imagine part of the danger of living in a home like mine. I mean, I, I, lit, like I wake up and like, good morning, how are you? Good, I just want to list out all the covenants in the Bible. Good morning. I mean, I'm a content guy. And uh, there's just, I love theology, I love God's Word. But I had to be careful that I passed on intimacy with Jesus and the explicit gospel. I could not believe or could not just trust that kids would pick up a little phrase or idea here and this would be enough to win their hearts for their lives. And so we've got to tend and make sure that we keep our passion and our dependency on God. We've got to break off spiritual complacency. Second thing we have to do is we've got to break off worldliness. Break off worldliness. Verse 13, fear the Lord your God, serve him only. Take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods. The gods of the peoples around you, for the Lord your God who's among you is a jealous God. And his anger will burn against you and he will destroy you from the face of the land. And this is a warning. He says, you know what, I want to be in a relationship with you. But if you live like the Canaanites, you'll be treated like the Canaanites. So you've got to get rid of worldliness. This had the idea, the children of Israel, as you know, were, were commanded not to make graven images, images of God. And when they made those images of God, if they weren't careful, they would turn them into idols and shape God after their own making. And the nations around them did this. They would basically have these idols and they would parade them through the streets and through the towns. And if you wanted to worship that God or celebrate that God, you would join the parade and follow that God. And during the parade, there was often debauchery, there was often alcohol abuse, sexual immorality. God says, when you go into the promised land, you're going to be tempted to join the parade of the other nations and go after other gods. Do not do that to me. Be loyal to me. Be faithful to me. Now, part of the challenge at this time of history is we don't, we don't even really talk about worldliness, do we? Like, when's the last time one said, hey, can I just have a moment with you? Look, I don't want to be rude here, but I just sense a little bit of worldliness creeping into your life. I just want to check into your heart. How's it going? You'd be like, like what is this, 1972? Is this the shepherding movement? Like, what, what is even happening here? Like, you're making me nervous. You may, like, and we want to be culturally engaged. We want to be missional. And I'm about all these things, but we have to remember what God's Word says, that to be, the, to be a friend of the world makes you an enemy of God. 
So we've got to believe this in our hearts. We've got to resist worldliness coming at us. And rarely does it come as a direct assault. It's just like subtle little parades, little pieces of marketing that come past us. They win our affection. They recruit our vision of the good life. They teach us what to do with our money, where to give our attention, what to do with our hearts. And before you know it, we've lined up and we've followed the spirit of the age and it's leading us away from the things of God. It's these small things that we need to get out and prune where they're young. Because if not, if we don't get them in seed form, the fruit will be disastrous. I was like, let me tell you something. You know, when you have children, what they pick up from you. There's what you want to pass on and there's what you pass on. Now, look, I've got to be honest with you. I am not one of these pastors who swears. I'm not like behind the backs, like swearing or whatever. And sometimes people to, to sort of like be cool or down to earth will swear in front of me. I just never like it. Uh, I just, I, I believe that no unwholesome talk should come out of our mouths. The challenge with that is, though, I grew up in Australia, and uh, I'm growing up in Australia and working in that meat factory from 14 to 20, my very formative years. I would just say there was not a Shakespearean vocabulary <laughs> imputed to me, particularly in moments of stress. Now, in my marriage, I have a cross-cultural marriage, married an American, there is some conjecture as to what constitutes bad language. Okay. So there are some words used in common Australian life that are inappropriate in Australian culture. I remember taking my daughter there and she looked at all of these grandmothers and their language and she was literally like, you weren't kidding, Dad. I, I, I didn't want... I only wanted my kids to pick up blessing. One day, and Christy's warning me. She's like, you've got to stop talking like that in front of the kids. I'm like, stop speaking Australian in front of a child. What about our cultural heritage? They're going to need to know these words if they ever visit, blah, blah, blah. Christy's like, cut it out. One, now, look, my daughter, I don't know if you're aware of like When my daughter was about two, she was 100% girl. And what I mean by everything was pink. Everything was jewelry. It was high heels. Like, where's Haley? She's in Christie's closet. She's got makeup all over her face. I mean, straight up, just like a, a spirit of pink on her life. I went through a stage where I banned glitter from my home. I was like, Haley, darling, Christy, be quiet. Haley, I am telling you right now, we're done with glitter. We're not doing glitter pens. We're not doing glue and glitter. Glitter is done. Everything I owned had glitter on it. I'd be in these important meetings and people are looking at me funny. And my daughter had snuck glitter into the home and she'd hug me goodbye and there was glitter all over my blazers. Pure girl. And one day we're sitting in the room. My daughter comes by singing a Disney song, but she's changed the words and the words are words that are acceptable in Australia, but not acceptable in the United States. And she's made her own song from my bad vocabulary, and she's singing it to the Little Mermaid theme as she walks past me. <laughs> and Christy just looks at me like... I was like, no, I get it. <laughs> Never again. Here's my point. Those little things, man, they creep in. To this day, to this day, my 17-year-old daughter will say, watch your mouth, Dad. Because something in her heart has taken on. Little bits of worldliness can creep into our life. Can I just ask you, is there anything that's gotten into your life that the culture tolerates but you know that God doesn't? That you're letting the world dictate the standards of but not God? These small things... When they came amongst the children of Israel, it led to spiritual disaster. If you're going to pass on an inheritance, if you're going to build an altar that the next generation can worship at and meet God at and thank God for, you've got to break off complacency and you've got to get rid of worldliness and seed form in your life. Second thing we have to do is we've got to build. We've got to build the right things. Look at, look, look at what it says in this verse. It's, it's a, beautiful, a beautiful verse about how to obey and love God. First thing we have to build is a compelling vision of God. Hear, O Israel. So listen, listen. The Lord our God, 
He's one. There's no one like him. Look at what he's done for us. And they, they narrate the story about the goodness of God, about his saving power, about his mighty hand, about his kind heart, about his provision and his deliverance for them. And so we've got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Tozer said, what we think about God is the most important thing about who we are. When you, when you close your eyes, when, you, when you're left alone, when all the, the hype's broken down in your inner person, who is God to you? Is he great? Is he mighty? Is he beautiful? Is he compelling? Because when the pressure's on, when none of the stuff that you want God to do is happening, and you're sitting there and you feel like Job, is he still beautiful and good and gracious? Who is he in your heart? In the... In the, the survey about the religious trends of the coming generation called the great opportunity they noted that 42 million kids will walk away from their faith in the next 30 years or so and the the tragedy of this is is that 42 percent walk away because they're just not interested in faith like we have done the impossible we've made jesus the most the god man the Son of God on earth, the eternal Logos. We've made Him boring. The one who can heal the sick, have authority over demons, raise the dead, has the most brilliant teaching on earth, defied categories, confronted injustice. We've made this amazing Savior nice. What a tragedy to pass on. And so they see the other gods and the parades of other visions and they say, this looks better than that. Who is like Jesus? Nobody else in history holds the tension of truth and love like Jesus Christ. Nobody else can have such convictions about the way of God and yet some compassion for those who fall short of it. Jesus' teachings on the Sermon on the Mount, they're so radical, they're such high standards. And you think he would come down from the Sermon on the Mount and just destroy people. Like that scene where the woman's caught in adultery and they all show up with the stones and he says, he who is without sin, throw the first stone and they all drop the stones and Jesus is like, thank you very much, I'm without sin. And he gets the stones, he just starts pelting her. No, Jesus without sin creates a space to show mercy to her. Our culture is so broken because you have people with compassion but no convictions and you get people with convictions but no compassion. But here you have Jesus holding these things in tension. We have to give the next generation a beautiful vision of who God is. Is that happening in your heart? Is that happening in your life? I, I, wanted, my, I wanted my children to know how great God is. So anytime there was a miracle in our house, I'd sit our kids down. I remember this one occasion, we needed $50,000 for, for some church planning stuff we were doing. We got together as a family. My kids prayed so, such cute prayers when they were little. Dear God, please give us $50 million. I mean, you're like, they're just praying all this. And I'm like, amen. They're praying all this stuff, right? <laughs> At the end of the week, someone sent us a $50,000 check. And I said, like, kids, I need you to sit down on the couch. And, they're, you know, they're all fidgety. And they're like, what's a... And I was like, how much do we pray for? Okay, here's a check for $50,000. I want you to know God hears your prayer. Behold, a listening God. And they, you know, they, they would love it and they'd be all awesome. <laughs> Anytime. Most pastors' kids hate the church. And so many of them hate the church because people can be mean. The sheep can bite at times. But I said, you know what? I want my kids, I want my kids to see the best of the church. Anytime somebody would bless us financially, I'd either speak at something or someone would, I would always take my kid, I would take that money. I would like tithe fun to my children. I would say, kids, we're going to the movies tonight. Tonight's entertainment is brought to you by the generosity of the people of God. And I wanted my kids to see the best of the church, to know that God's people are generous and that being a part of a community of faith is a blessing and not a curse. We have a responsibility to let the next generation know that our God is compelling and beautiful, that the church can be a thing of utter beauty in the world. We have to make God compelling. Second thing we have to do, we have to build an ecosystem of discipleship. Look at how holistic their vision of discipleship was. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. 
Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. This is an incredible vision of holistic discipleship. It's got to start, get this stuff in your hearts and then impress them on your children. Now, here's the thing. Some people, for I don't know because of legalism or, or abuse or whatever, they say, we should not coerce our children. We should not force God down their throat. And I'm like, what are you talking about? The only thing that's happening on planet Earth right now is that brands and corporations and ideologies and worldviews are being forced down our children's throats. Everybody's trying to impress a vision and a morality and an ethic and practices and brands into our kids' lives. We have a responsibility to take the beauty of Jesus and make him come alive in their hearts. And then we're to do this at home and on the road when we lie down and get up. We're to write them as symbols on our hands and our heads, doors and gates. And here's, here's how the Jewish community did this. They had like holistic, next slide, holistic integrated practices. You see out and you, you go out to Brooklyn today, you'll still see the Jewish community. You go to b h photo, you'll see this. There's moments when they literally pause and bring a physical reality so God is everywhere in their life. The mezuzah on the Jewish door, when you go in, you'll see this in many of your apartment buildings, like a little tube just slightly slanted on the door. And, and it says, he will guard your coming and your going both now and forevermore. And it was a moment of transition. You're now going out into the world as the people of God. You're not coming home as his covenant family. They had all of these traditions. And I just want to submit that one hour of Sunday school and a little occasional Bible reading is not going to win the heart of the next generation. We have to have holistic discipleship. We have to pour into them. We have to be creative in doing this. An ecosystem of discipleships, heart, habits, rituals, practices, traditions, rites of passage, bringing them into the Christian story. My son, I I, uh, created this discipleship journey for my son. It's called the Primal Path. And sometimes people listen to that and it sounds like, they're like, that sounds like it's from Colorado. And I'm like, let me ask you a question. If you're trying to capture the mind of a 12-year-old, you don't call it like a sophisticated plan for you know, adolescent boys to mature stage by stage in a functional manner. You know, they're, they're 12. I want them to be excited and fearful at the same time. <laughs> Yo, Nate, you ready for the primal path? Are you? Are you? I wanted, I wanted him to have some, like, some anticipation towards this. And so I, I basically read all these books on men's ministry and did an immersion for him. We did a severing dinner with his mother where she said, I'm handing you over to the community of men. You're going to want to come to me for comfort and I will not give it to you. I will force you back to men so that your heart grows up into a mature man. And she prayed over him and blessed him. And I, here's the six roles every man must master. And we did these modules on this. And here's five shifts every young boy needs to make in order to move from you know, childhood into manhood. And I took him on a trip to Australia to immerse him into my own cultural narrative and build values, blah, 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 blah. Six years, a lot of time. I would get him up in the morning at 5.30 and I'd say, we're taking ground today. And everything I did, I, we, I parented basically by social contract, which is non-coercive agreements about the commitments we want to make in life, including blessings and discipline. <laughs> One day, so I'll be like this, Nate, do you want me to wake you up to do the primal path tomorrow morning? Yes or no? You don't have to. You're becoming your own man in the world. One day you'll be on your own in a college dorm or an apartment and I won't be here to wake you up. Do you want to rise to the challenge? Yes, Dad, I want to rise to the challenge. Now, Nate, I need to tell you something right now. I don't know 14-year-old boys that by default love getting up at 5.30. I have a sense at 5.30 tomorrow you may rethink this decision in a moment of physical weakness and sleep deprivation. (laughs) Would you like me to provide some accountability to wake you up at 5.30? Yes. What measures can I use to wake you up to ensure that you leave the bed? I say all this to say my son likes to tell a story about how one time I poured coffee on him to get him out of bed. And I did do that. But I want you to know we agreed the night before that that was one of the consequences of failing to wake up. Last summer, we hiked 500 miles across Spain together to debrief in 33 days, one day for every year of Jesus' life on earth. Debrief his gap year. 
talk about what he'd learned over this six-year journey. The end of it, and Finister, he ran into the ocean off the coast of Spain in a ceremony I created to welcome him into manhood. A bunch of men from our church read blessings over him, the things they'd seen over the six years. I laid my hands on him, I imparted every blessing in my life, and he came out, raised his hands in victory. Welcome to manhood, Nathan. It was powerful. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people said to me, like, that's so much work. And you know what I said? He's my son. I love him. I want to give my son as much time as I can while I have him in this little window. Some people give so much time to sports and would never consider giving the same amount of time to discipleship. We are called to give everything we have in the time we have to raise up the next generation. It's got to be when they sit, when they stand, when they walk, when they go, when they rise, when they come. We need an environment around them. A community, a congregation, a pathway that says, I will grab, if I, in a beautiful, loving social contract, I'm going to pull you out of apathy. I'm going to pull you into your destiny. I'm going to give you everything I have. We need a vision like this. And then the last thing I think we're called to build is a, is a vision of, of spiritual legacy. In this passage, it's in the future when your son asks, why are we doing this? This is a time for you to tell a story. It's time to tell a story about where you've been and it's a time to tell the story about where you're going as a people. It's a long game. And in this passage, you've got the God of generations, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In this, you've got the story of history again and again and again and again of God saying, when you are children and you are children's children, this is a long game vision. And often, when I think about how Christians think about the city of New York, it's, it's so sophomoric compared to how other people think about the city. Ethnic communities come here and they literally, they move into the same neighborhood and they start businesses. And they try to build an ecosystem of thriving so they can make their way into the city. They encourage their kids into particular careers to have enough wealth to buy apartment buildings so they can move more people in. They can belong to a place. Look at how the Jewish communities thought about New York. Look at how sexual minorities think about moving into communities. And, and Christians think about being here for two or three years if they like it or not. Like the reason we have no long-term institutional influence in this city is we've just yielded it to everybody else with longer vision. And at some point, I think it's important that we stake a claim into the future. We ask God, give us a long play for what is to come. I unapologetically pray for a spiritual legacy where 100 years from now, young kids hungry for revival say, this is one of the altars that John Tyson used to pray at in New York City. And he prayed here before God answered his prayer and gave him those three buildings. That's the cry of his heart. Bless God. But I want to have places in the city where kids come and they do their own revival tours through the city at places where you have prayed and I have prayed. Don't you want 80 years from now, people walking around going, is this one of those churches planted during that wave of the Spirit? Did you, were you in that? It's like, yeah, man, my grandma brought an apartment. She went in long game. Now I have generational blessing. How long is your vision for what it is that God wants to do? I, I'm not saying you have to stay forever. Follow the Spirit as He leads. But at least consider that the long game may be your game. Give your heart to God. See what He does. You never know. So we've got to break off. We've got to build up. We've got to have altars in our homes and in our relationships for the next generation. Now, this was an urgent moment for the children of Israel in the Old Testament. I want to put forth, it's an urgent moment in our generation too. The latest research shows that 64% of people raised in faith will walk away from it in their 20s. Now, to give, I'm not trying to be like manipulative at all, but I want you to imagine that we brought all the kids in our kids' ministry out for like the Christmas song. The costumes don't fit. There's always that one performer kid that's waving at his... It's just like literally adorableness just strewn across the stage. All these little kids. Then I want you to imagine and say, okay, kids, let me take two-thirds of you over to this side of the stage. You're all going to become atheists in your 20s. And then one-third of you are going to walk with Jesus. Like we, we would go, no, that's not right. Yet that's what will happen unless God's people get a vision and some urgency to close that gap. We live in an urgent moment too. Most of our kids are not prepared for the world that we're moving into. In the book, uh, Faith in Exile, which is a book by um, Dave Kinnaman, 
He gives this little chart here. I want to show you this chart. He basically says that we're just not equipped to disciple in the age that we live. I want you to think about the changes that have happened in the last 10 years. The last five years around what is gender? How do you disciple in that conversation? What is globalization? What is critical theory? What, what, what are the, the giant thought patterns and understandings of our world today? How do we get kids who can thrive in these realities, understand the gospel, present it in a compelling and winsome way and live for Jesus with all of their hearts? So the challenge, as he points out in this book, is most of us come from places of stability and safety where there's a shared cultural framework. And he calls this Jerusalem, the sort of mono-religious. You still see places in the South and the Midwest today where if you say God, they mean the Christian God. If you say church, they mean like First Baptist or something. Mono-religious, slower paced, homogenous, central control, sweet and simple. And the idols are religious pride and false piety. There's still places in the country where if you're not a part of a church community, it is a detriment to your social standing. But we're moving into a world and you live in this world. You're natives of this world where it's so different. It's pluralistic. It's accelerated, frenetic, diverse, open source, complex, bittersweet, fitting in, not missing out. These are the things that people wrestle with. So we have to have a vision to help kids thrive in this reality. Look at how the Jewish community think about this. Josephus said this, our ground is good and we work it to the utmost, but our chief ambition is for the education of our children. We take most pains of all with the instruction of children and esteem the observation of the laws and the piety corresponding with them as the most important affair of our whole life. This is a vision for raising resilient kids in the coming age. So let me ask you a question. What do you need to break off from your story in order to help build an older that the next generation can worship at? What do you need to break off? There's a thing called the genogram. And uh, it's one of those tools that, you know, sociologists use to help you sort of make sense of your story. Family therapists use it too. It's like you put Stan Getz on, you get a couple of bagels, an Americano, and you deal with generational dysfunction on a Saturday morning at your apartment. It's nice, isn't it? <laughs> it just basically lets you just say, like, what's bleeding into my story? And here, it's important to understand this because in moments of stress, you would default not to who you wish you'd be, but who you've actually been formed to be. And there'll be all sorts of drama there. When I got married, Christy and I, just a couple of young kids, trying to keep it honest in Bible college, just sort of, you know, we, we had two premarital counseling appointments. The first one, the guy honestly said to us, like, hey, you guys are aware of how dysfunctional the family is, right? We're like, Ooh. Yeah. and he's like, I need you to be aware of how dysfunctional your family is. And it was one of our in-laws' closest friends. So, yeah, yeah, no, we'll talk about how dysfunctional they are. We'll come back next week, get together. And he goes, you guys, you're aware, right? We're like, yeah. He goes, okay, well, all the best. God bless. And that was our premarital counseling. What we didn't understand is that on both sides of our family, waiting to bleed down was sexual abuse, horrific sexual abuse, suicide, legalism, bankruptcy, incarceration, alcoholism, divorce, murder, and legalism. Like, like real generational patterns here. And I was like, if, if, if and, and we started like experiencing stress, financial stress as newlyweds, ministry stress, trying to serve God, trying to process our own past, our own sin. Just these moments where we're like, if we don't break this stuff off, this stuff's going to flow into the lives of our kids. And I'm telling you, we did Derek Prince blessings and curses. We did the bondage breaker. We did freedom in Christ. We did deliverance. We did like making peace with your past. Everything we could get our hands on, we did. Fasting, praying, anointing with oil, bedtime prayers, declarations. Now that may sound intense, but when that stuff begins to manifest, and you realize if I don't break this off, this stuff is going to come through my life. You sense that urgency. Is there anything, even as I'm speaking, the Holy Spirit says to you, you got to break that off. Let me tell you something. God loves to bring freedom from generational patterns. He loves to draw a line and then start new families of blessing. He specializes in it. Is there anything that could, is there freedom possible? Is there a way that blessing can flow through your life? Because of what God does. 
There's a, there's a passage in the book of Judges, and I, I really believe this is a word for our church. I read this. It was burning in me. And it's a powerful scene in the book of Judges because, again, Judges is that cycle where they did not listen to God in Deuteronomy 6. And then you've got generational curses, these horrible cycles in the book of Judges. But then you've got this one scene where God appears to Gideon, and Gideon is my favorite judge by far. And God appears to Gideon, and this is what he says. The Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. And listen, so Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, the Lord is peace. To this day, it stands in Ophrah of the Abazrites. That same night, the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper altar Proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height, using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down off of the second bull as a burnt offering. Do you understand in a patriarchal society what a risk it was to defy your father, take his property, tear down his golds, build an, build an altar to another God and declare a new loyalty? There was tremendous risk, but Gideon does it. And here's what I want you to know. Look at Gideon's story. God uses him to deliver the nation because of a moment of faithfulness where he tears down false gods, raises up new gods, the right God based on the right altar. And I, I honestly believe there is power and freedom available to, to you tonight. We've got people in our church that grew up in Mormonism and they had a revelation, this is a false god. And they, against all of the family pressure and dynamics, left Mormonism, became followers of the real Jesus and built a new altar to him and are living with faithfulness and blessing. We've got people in our church who have broken off dysfunctional generational patterns in marriage, financial patterns, and now they're building on the altar of God's word and loyalty to the one true God. And I want to tell you, when you do that, you have no idea the deliverance that can come through your story if you tear down and you build up. What do you tonight need to break off? The second thing is, what do you need to build? At our church, the reason we keep repeating the same things is because A, the Bible tells you that repetition is a biblical concept, and B, we want to make it simple. So it's like, well, what do you teach your kids? Okay, teach your kids to love God's presence. Teach them how to access the presence of God. Teach your kids a vision of the power of the Holy Spirit to change us from our old selves into the image of Jesus. And teach our kids what God's doing in the world and how to join in presence, formation, mission. And so you're like, I don't know how to disciple someone. Help them access the presence of God. Help them become like Jesus. Help them join Jesus' mission in the world. And he's like, well, that's, okay, great. Well, what else can I do? How about gospel identity, community, mission, power? We wrote a book on this. It's on the table out the front. You can literally sit down. We even wrote resources you can impart and customize and pour into the next generation. And then it's building rhythms and practices and culture and values and experiences that help them do this. Look, I want to be clear here. My vision is not to raise up socially awkward, culturally inarticulate, terrified kids who when they go to college lose their virginity the first week and join a frat and party for the rest of their lives. I'm not talking about weird kids who lose their faith. I'm literally talking about kids like Daniel, formed in the way of Jesus, understanding the supernatural, joining God in his mission of redemption, shot into the hardest places on earth that can bring the kingdom of God. And it's going to take all of us to pour into these kids to make that happen. So I, I can't help but sense God is giving all of us an invitation to break off generational cycles and raise up a different generation. Look, if you can raise godly kids who love Jesus and can engage the city in a place like New York, you can do it anywhere. What an advantage. Look, look, look at the culture of our church. Praise God. A generous culture. A prayerful culture. An evangelistic culture. A theologically informed culture. And I want you to imagine that your experience, your heart, your lessons, your generosity, all of that was pointed to the children and youth in our church. And all of us came around them like a cloud of witnesses, pouring into them, raising them up to spiritual possibility. Look at the talent in our church. 
What could happen in the lives of these kids if we stewarded what we have, if we built an altar that they could worship and sacrifice on for their generation? We could change how people view youth youth discipleship in the Western church. I don't say that lightly. It's really possible. There's a crisis. We have an opportunity. And I want to call you to take part in it. To take part in it. Psalm 78 says this. My people hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders that he has done. If God's really going to bring a spiritual awakening in this city, We have to have altars in our hearts, passion for God, holiness in our hearts, that the fire of God can fall on. We need to tend to the flame in our hearts. But the second thing we need to do is we need to build an altar in our homes and in our relationships for the next generation. And we need to tend with spiritual passion and with holiness. And we need to build ecosystems of discipleship. And we need to make Jesus beautiful and compelling so the next generation go further than you and I ever came. I ask myself this all the time. I've paid a high price to live in New York 15 years. I have been through a lot of spiritual warfare to plant the churches I've planted. And if I'm not careful, I can think, God, what have you got for me? Instead of realizing maybe all of this is for my children and their children, not for me at all. Maybe I'm just building a foundation and God's going to accelerate his work through their lives. And maybe it's true of you. Maybe we're here to build something for them. If the fire is going to fall, it's going to fall on our hearts. And it's going to fall on the altar of the home. And so I want us just to move into a time of ministry tonight just to respond And some of you feel like you're disqualified. Some of you are like, I could never like invest in the next generation. It's like, I don't even understand Snapchat. I'm not cool. Like I honestly, like I struggle with how to connect. They don't need you to be cool. They just need you to show up and love them and listen to them. Often the most powerful voices are those voices of older mentors and friends who are willing to just reaffirm and to speak into. I was a youth pastor. I I had the privilege of leading one of the largest student ministries in America. And as I went back years later and I said, who still walks with God and what are the factors? One of the key factors is the older people around your age got these kids in their teenage years and pulled them into the future. And I've got memories of kids all over the city of Nashville sitting in Starbucks with some of the most socially awkward middle-aged people pouring into these kids' lives. It changed these kids' lives. They're still walking with Jesus today. I just have a sense he wants to do that through us he wants to use you in that way do not disqualify yourself God has qualified you to raise up the next generation so if you sense tonight the Holy Spirit spoken and if you sense I need to break something off tonight I sense an invitation from the Holy Spirit to tear down the idolatry of my family and to build a new altar and that God will use their idolatry as fuel for your faithfulness to bring about a story of deliverance and you want freedom in your family tonight, you want to mark a line and you want to say, God, I want to step into your future. Enough, it stops here. And you want freedom, you can get freedom tonight. So I want to invite our prayer team to come. If you you want to respond to that, I want to encourage you, come forward for prayer. Mark the moment, make a declaration. And I'm telling you, when I was desperate, I went forward for every kind of prayer in every venue and in every environment. And people are like, what would you like prayer for? And I'm like, I need to break off generational spirits. And they're like, okay, thank you for your request. And then they would lean in and pray for me. You can walk out of here with a spirit of freedom in your life tonight. And maybe you sense God asking you to build something. Maybe it's, it's a call to begin to build those practices, to build an altar that others can worship at. Maybe it's it's not actual children. Maybe it's spiritual children. Maybe it's mentoring, but whatever it is, don't you want a godly legacy to pass on? God wants to use you.